Welcome back. This is our second episode of The Wood Between the Worlds with Jim Stump. We've surfaced again from another plenary talk. We can relax a little before diving into another pool, another world, another plenary talk. If you would like to bring some of these conversations to your church or school, BioLogos has a speakers bureau where you can, you can find this on our website, people who might be invited to come and give talks, or perhaps they can visit you virtually like we're doing here today. Uh, we also want to let you know that by next March, we fully expect to be holding an in-person conference, March 24, 25, in San Diego. It will prominently feature more work on creation care, as well as a host of other topics. You can find more information about it in the Whova app that you're using right now under the Exhibitors tab. And finally, for this commercial, you can stay in touch with everything going on at Biologos by joining our email list. You can control how often you receive it, and we will not sell or give away your information to other organizations. If you've never been to our website before, you can simply go to biologos.org, and within not too long, a very helpful little pop-up window will appear and give you the opportunity to join the email list. If you have been to the website already and for some reason dismissed that pop-up without even reading it, you can go to the Get Involved tab on the website and find that link there to sign up. And now, on to our panel. It seems appropriate to talk about the wood between the worlds, to allude to a prominent literary work of British literature by C.S. Lewis, because our first panelist this time is actually a literature professor at Calvin University, Deborah Reenstra. How does someone with your background and training end up working in an area like creation care? Well, you won't be surprised to hear that I came to this through books. Not a surprise. <laughs> so Calvin University has this beautiful event called the Festival of Faith and Writing. And I've been involved in helping to plan that event for a long time. And somehow I got involved in uh, reading nature writers and mm. then inviting nature writers um, to come to our festival. And through that, started reading people like Kathleen Dean Moore and um, uh, Scott Russell Sanders and then Bill McKibben. Mm. So it was really when Bill McKibben came to campus that uh, I had done a lot of reading to prepare for his visit and just really became convicted that this was important and um, started to shift my scholarship toward eco-theology, got involved with some projects at Calvin University, cross-disciplinary projects in eco-theology, um, and just found it completely compelling, hmm. as if it had become a kind of missing piece um, from all my theological and literary training. I, I kind of missed the moment. I, I graduated grad school just before eco-criticism became a big deal. So I kind of missed that moment, so now I'm going back to catch up. Well, very good. So your session tomorrow is called Refugia Faith, Adapting Spiritual Practice for a World in Crisis. Give us a little taste of what that will address and may at least explain refugia faith for just a little bit here. Sure. So refugia is a biological term, and I learned this from a book by Kathleen Dean Moore, of course. Um, it's the idea of the little places that survive in the midst of a crisis and out of which an ecosystem can repair itself or spread or grow. And when I read about that concept in refugial conservation biology, um, it just struck me as this, of course, powerful metaphor. So I've spent the past few years um, sort of trampling all over actual science by creating a metaphor out of this. But it just really struck me that refugia, refugia places, is a really great metaphor for what the church should be. We should be the people of refugia. So I started to think about that and um, have since written a book manuscript that's going to come out in February. So I'll just be talking about seven transformations of our theological thinking and spiritual practice that I think can help us um, reflect on and become people of refugia. Mm, very good. Secondly, Rahel Wells, your disciplinary background is both in biology and biblical studies, and it sounds like that confluence is a little more straightforwardly connected to creation care. Tell us a little bit about your work today. Yeah, so I teach currently Old Testament. That's, what, that's my vocation at the moment, but I have a background, a master's in biology, and 
I've really kind of always been interested in both of them and had a really hard time deciding which way to go. Even to the doctoral level, I applied to programs in both and just mm -hmm. trying, to, trying to figure out which would be the direction. Um, and really felt called to do something kind of interdisciplinary, which is what, why I ended up at Wheaton doing my PhD there with um, working on God's response to animal vocalized need. And so that really kind of led to um, some of the things I'm sharing in my talk tomorrow, which is about God responding and how God responds to when animals cry out to him. So I will... Uh give a little shout out to that particularly your session tomorrow is called how the animals groan should christians care about non-human suffering i suspect the answer to that question is yes or i doubt if we would have invited you here to give the talk but maybe give us a little bit more than just the one word answer that might pique the interest of our listeners to come back tomorrow and hear the whole story yeah well i think um i talk a little bit about you know how most people think we shouldn't really care about it because we should care about human suffering or even the earth itself. And so what does the Bible say about God's care for, for his creatures, for all of his creatures, humans and, and non-humans? And then what is our human responsibility according to scripture? But then what does that lead us to in practical ways that then also tie into science? And so I, I focus on, on diet and how hmm. usually we think of recycling or, you know, um, something like that, which are very important things, but diet is also really important, and we're seeing that now both in Scripture and in science. Mm. Oh, very interesting. Turns out uh, creation is connected in lots of ways. Then, huh? Well, for the rest of this session here, we have uh, been asked to talk about talking to others about creation care, and specifically I'd like to hear each of you speak a little bit about how we might find a mean between two common extremes that we find in people in response to a call for creation care like this. So on the one hand, we might find one of almost indifference that like, I'm not even motivated enough to care about any of this, so I'm not going to do anything. And on the other hand, it might be, oh man, we just listened to Kyle and saw all these slides, and if I didn't hear the whole story, I might be driven to thinking there's nothing we, the problem is so big, I'm driven to despair and might not do anything. What's the mean between those? What are we hoping to find instead of the extreme of indifference or despair that is a better and more helpful and hopeful response that we might find from people? And how do we get to the point of eliciting that response from people? Well, I really appreciated Kyle's presentation because he did give us some of that hope already, right? So I yeah. think he brought a good balance of saying, yes, we need to understand what's going on. And yes, that can lead us sometimes to despair. And that's when we need to find stories of hope because there are those. And so finding a balance as to what we ourselves, I think, listen to and, and are connected to knowing the reality of the difficult things that we're doing to this earth and um, the state we are in, but then also the hopeful stories that come too. And I think then as we are feeding that balance to ourselves, we can then better feed it to other people. Hmm. Yeah, I think the uh, answer is constructive action and faith. And, and you, your question, you know, implies that neither indifference nor despair are morally supportable approaches. Um, both of them are kind of moral failures. But it's very difficult to tell people, well, stop being indifferent, you know? You have to care more than this. And it's also very difficult to tell people, well, stop despairing, you know, your feelings are wrong. So um, I, think, I think you're right, uh, Rahel, that there, <clears throat> there has to be some uh, action that comes before feeling, almost, you know? So involvement with others and curating your own, you know, um, what you, what comes across your mind, curating that so that you have uh, attention to what is hopeful um, is also really important. But, you know, I, I think we have to acknowledge that people's indifference sometimes comes out of a place of feeling overwhelmed. And we live in a time um, where the world is so complex and changing so quickly, and we know so much 
that we do feel overwhelmed a lot of times. And, you know, the same is true of despair. I think we, we live in a really difficult period of human history. And so I think it's okay to just acknowledge that we are tempted to indifference and despair. I, I don't think we want to whisk that away um, and say it's wrong, even though I just finished saying it's not morally supportable. <laughs> it's not morally supportable to stay there. But uh, I think we do need to acknowledge, and I, I know you too, Rahel, deal with young people every day, and they are overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed um, by the prospect of a dim future. And so we, I think we, we need to acknowledge that both of those reactions are natural and to some extent appropriate, but we need to move beyond those. So let's drill down a little bit further into this. Um, in our last panel, Steve Bauma Prediger said, hope is a verb. The things you were just describing there were reactions, feelings. I can't help uh, pushing a little further into the literary realm here, at least, and talk about those are, have classically been called passions, right? They're passive. They're things that happen to us, as opposed to hope being a verb, some action that we can take. Is that a helpful distinction, you think, in all of this? To acknowledge, to acknowledge the feelings that people find themselves having in response to lots of information or calls, as opposed to active things that can be done. Is there a way to move helpfully from, okay, yes, I can affirm what you're feeling, but let's channel this into action that might bring about this this virtue of hope as opposed to just a feeling of something that's happening to me. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would say this is what I try to practice. I cannot say I do this every month, but I try on a monthly basis to kind of examine my life. What is one small change I can make different this month? So that each month I'm adding another small thing. It might not be a very big thing. But maybe Is it's it just too personal to pry into what some of those <laughs> things might be as examples for the rest of us. Yeah. So, for instance, right now I live in a, a, a subdivision. I, I walk every day to work. Um, I've started now um, also. So I didn't used to walk in the rain. Now I do. I got some good rain boots <laughs> and I walk in the rain. Um, I walk in the snow. I ski <laughs> to work actually when it's snowing. But. Um, something my husband and I are going to try this next month is start a small micro prairie in our yard. Mm -hmm. So we realized there's so many people around us that are, you know, just, they use insecticides and all of this, and we have hardly any insects. And so just, just small things. And then each year we're going to expand it a little bit until it's big enough that hopefully we can attract some butterflies and, you know, small things like that. It, it, we can't do a lot, but we can do a little bit in our area. Planting trees, so we're also planning to plant a couple more trees on our property. It's small, but what are the small things? We're also, this is a big thing, but we are looking into installing solar on our house in the next year. So hmm. it's something I've wanted to do for a long time, but haven't been able to. So just, just you know, planning ahead for bigger things, but what are, what are the small things you can do? A change in diet, maybe one, one less um, serving of meat that week. You know, something, something small, but a change. I've been thinking a lot lately about uh, the role that these small changes can have in life. And we're completely aware that in order to stave off the one and a half or the two or the three degree temperature increase that's coming, we need to do more as a society, as a culture, than walk to work in the rain and start a micro prairie. But I wonder if actions like those can prime us in certain ways that maybe I'm not ready right now to start pushing for massive legislation change with my legislators and to really, but if I start doing some of these other things, it brings me further into the community that does prepare me and the community around to make make some of the bigger, more difficult changes that are going to be coming. Do you think there's anything in, in I, I think that's the kind of response to people who say, oh, come on, that's not going to make any difference. What, yeah. Isn't there some difference still? Yeah, so uh, I would recommend this wonderful article by Mary Anais Heglar, who writes about climate change, um, and it's called, I Don't Care If You Recycle. And it's exactly that problem, that people become discouraged because they feel like my little single actions aren't going to make a difference. 
And it's true that our single actions, uh, no amount of our personal virtues <laughs> is gonna make the difference we need. This needs to be systemic, it needs to be global, it needs to be political, sorry but it does. It needs to be about you know, gigantic multinational businesses doing the right things. And no, I have no leverage over gigantic multinational businesses myself. But that's the thing, we have to do this in community, and so we can't just be one person. So probably the number one thing all of us have to do is get connected. And getting connected with an organization like BioLogos is a great idea. Uh, I think it's probably ideal for all of us to be connected very locally as well as globally. And we just each have to find our own way to do that. But that's, uh, I think that personal discipline is really important as a matter of personal integrity. It's important as an example to others. And also I think it's important for exactly as you were describing, that kind of psychological function of action comes first. Action comes when we act in hopeful ways, we start to feel more hopeful too. So there's psychological literature about this and I don't know all the psychological terms for that. But uh, that, that personal discipline is a kind of ritual that creates that discipline of hope. And in community, if you're joining in a community, maybe the, you know, there's climate lobbies you can join in, there's you know, petitions you can sign, and as you are joining in community, that encourages you too, right? Because you see what other people are doing, oh, I could maybe do that, right? So if you're just by yourself, it does feel, it can feel overwhelming, even to make changes, even to make personal changes. But in community, when you're with other people who are seeking to do that also, it can be encouraging, can mm -hmm. bring hope. Yeah, one of the things that I, I think has helped me in the past five or six years is I've really been diving into things like the IPCC report and thinking, oh, so we have messed up the ocean and it's not gonna heal for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. That's what the IPCC report says. And there's definitely grief about that. But what keeps me going in that discipline of hope is the uh, constant encounters either in person or through what they write or um, say, with amazing people all over the world who are doing amazing things. I mean, Kyle is a good example whose uh, talk we just heard. The world is full of people like that. And I just see that as the work of God's spirit in the world, renewing creation. And to me, that, that allows me to keep going in this work. So I've uh, looked at the IPCC report too. Um, one of the things that really stood out to me is that even if today we ceased the emission of all greenhouse gases, the climate is going to get worse for at least 30 more years, right? And when I look in the actuarial tables at somebody of my age, I go, oh, so <laughs> pretty much for the rest of my life, this is what we have to look forward to. That makes me wonder about the difference between being optimistic, which I'm not very optimistic right now, versus cultivation of hopefulness. And maybe this is just one more way of asking the, the exact same question. But I wonder, I wonder if it's possible for us to not be terribly optimistic and still yet be hopeful and still yet cultivate hopefulness in all of this. What do you think? I think so. I mean, I think that's kind of what we're called to do as Christians. I think the Bible itself indicates even then the world was a pretty messed up place, and yet hope was ultimately in God and in what God's people can do, right? So it's not, <laughs> yeah, does, does the outlook necessarily look great? Not so much, but we're still called to act differently, to think differently, to hope differently, right? So it's kind of, kind of who we are called to be, people who see reality and yet can say, I'm hoping anyway because I have a bigger picture. I think it's easy for um, affluent white Americans to imagine that God, promise us, God promises us that everything's just gonna be hunky-dory all the time in our lives. And so our idea of hope sometimes verges on this kind of, I'm entitled to happiness and pleasant life, um, which is 
probably not true for most people in all of human history. Most people in all of human history expected suffering as a matter of course. So hope can't be that everything's gonna be splendid for me. That can't be our definition of hope. I think hope, at least for people of faith, is always about the faithfulness of God. That whatever happens, even if it's hard or difficult, or I, I have to accept limits, or even there's suffering in my life, um, it, it shouldn't be news <laughs> that even in those situations, God means us well, and God is faithful, and it's our relationship with God that won't fail, um, even when we can perhaps not expect that everything's gonna be perfect in our lives. And there's a difference between that and the kind of, well, I just have faith in God that God's gonna make everything turn out okay, irrespective of what I do, right? Isn't there, isn't there some way of affirming that ultimately our hope, our trust, our faith is in God, and yet we're called to work with God in those actions. Because when, when both of you just affirmed the, the faith and, and trust, hopefulness in God, it wasn't that instead of us yeah. doing things that we can do mm -hmm. here and now, right? Yeah, so here's where the professor from Calvin University is gonna talk about Calvinism. So <laughs> one of the principles of Calvinism is that uh, God always acts first, right? We, we are not the people who fix the world. We are not the people who uh, bring about any kind of redemption. That's the work of God. However, we participate with God out of gratitude and out of love for God. Hmm. So, you know, are we going to bring about salvation? No. But I, I, I often think that um, Christians can become too passive. I think we are used to looking to authority and to considering God as almighty, which is very true. But that doesn't mean that we're passive. We, we are part of a resurrection community and we're called to act. Uh, we have agency and responsibility, some of us more than others because of our privilege. So if we love God and are grateful to God for the very being of our lives, then we act according to what, what God loves and what God's purposes are. In the previous panel discussion with Steve and Veronica, I ended by asking them for some uh, practical advice or tips, next steps we might take in being more effective. And I think they both helpfully steered away from uh, Pollyanna kind of advice that let's just all do this and everything will be fine. Also earlier today, I uh, uh, got to talk to Kyle Van Houten a little longer and we did a, we recorded a podcast interview with him which will be available in three weeks from now or so. But in that, Kyle, I was asking about this, this same thing and Kyle's sitting out here so let's see if I quote you correctly but I think Kyle said, we are not called to effectiveness, we are called to faithfulness. So maybe instead of ending this little panel discussion with my asking for tips of ways we can be more effective, could each of you share a way or two that we might be more faithful in what we're called to be in the realm of creation care? Yeah, I think something that I was mulling around in my mind when you mentioned that that was maybe the question you might ask was just something that's really hard for me to do, actually, which is to talk to people who I disagree with, <laughs> who maybe don't think that we should care for the earth. And I have plenty of those. I think we probably all do. So what do we do? Am I being faithful in my relationships with them? Am I seeking out ways to share my beliefs with them in ways that they can hear? Am I listening to them? Am I understanding maybe the, the um, walls that they may have up? Am I, am I just barraging them or am I stepping back? So I remember listening, actually I think um, Catherine Hayhoe came up earlier as well. So I was listening to a lecture from her a couple of years ago, I was listening before COVID, um, and she talked about this and it was just really helpful for me, finding ways of connection with people you disagree with, of things that you both care about. So maybe it is, you know, a certain animal or something, right? And then, 
oh, wow, have you heard about the things that are happening to this animal? What can we do about that, right? And then you, you've built this connection, this bridge. And to me, that is an area of faithfulness that I really need to grow in because it is hard for me. I tend to just want to avoid confrontation, especially with people who I really know that are not going to agree with me on foundational things. But I have found that that is an area that I really need to grow in and that helps me to find hope because if I can get through to find a connection with that person that helps them maybe say, hey, maybe I really do need to care about the earth or about animals or about the climate, then I've built something that gives me hope mm -hmm. and maybe can give that person a different perspective also. Mm -hmm. Deborah? I would say two things. Uh, first of all, learning is faithfulness. Mm -hmm. So learning, becoming more educated about uh, climate change globally, but also locally. And so I would say local involvement is also a really good way to be faithful. And for me, that the most um, satisfying and rich uh, activities as far as local involvement have been like literally getting my hands muddy <laughs> and planting native plants. And I, we have done a little micro refugium in, in my yard too, but uh, I've worked with Plaster Creek Stewards so Gail Hefner is one of our breakout speakers too, and I've worked with that organization and just literally planted native plants. And um, that creates community and it also creates joy. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, the practice of joy is a kind of long-term survival tactic. Uh, we can't just slog through the rest of this, right? We have to be able to find joy. And for me, just, uh, working with plants has given me joy, but it's it's because I have learned what is needed in my local ecosystems, and so that local knowledge I think is a, a form of faithfulness that's very practical, and um, also has full of satisfactions. It's almost like that's what we were designed to do from Richard Middleton this morning, right? Well, thanks. We will uh, do our best to continue to be faithful by helping uh, our community learn about these things. We are uh, going to take one more dive back down in the pool in this wood between the worlds and resurface at the top of the hour for one more uh, plenary talk. This one from Milmer Martinez Vergara. We look forward to it very much. We'll see